So what are the main components of a worldview? Again, now before we go into this, just to, to make it clear, everybody has a worldview, just like everybody has a language. So human beings, part of what makes us human, as we'll talk about, is our capacity to acquire and use language. There are currently some 5,000 languages existing in the world. Many of them have only you know, a few hundred speakers and are at risk of dying out as soon as those speakers die. But you know, there are 5,000 uh, languages or so in the world. Every human being has at least one language. Um, uh, many people grow up, at least uh, actually more people in the world grow up bi or trilingually than monolingual. Um, strikes many Americans as odd because most people in America are, are, are monolingual. Um, but there's no human being that doesn't have an actual language, although the languages differ. Similarly, everybody has a worldview. Whether you grew up in, you know, America in the 21st century, or you know, Isfahan in the 14th century, or the Amazon rainforest in the, you know, third century, or ancient Rome, or wherever, right? Uh, everyone has sort of fundamental set of assumptions about the world, just like everyone has some kind of language. Now, if I want to know what kind of language do you speak, I'm going to ask. Well, how do you form your words? What does your morphology look like? You know, what about your syntax? How do you, how do you uh, um, you know, again, where do you place adjectives with regard to nouns? How do you, you know, deal with verb tense and aspect and all of that? And when you ask all of these questions about someone's language and you put that all together, you can get a pretty good idea of their language. Oh, okay, now I have a conception of what language you speak or what kind of language. When it comes to a worldview, again, I would sub submit that there are also some basic categories that we can think in terms of that if you want to know what a person's worldview is, you basically ask a number, I mean, not explicitly, but you would try to find out the person's response or the culture's response to a number of basic uh, uh, questions or how basic, you know, uh, categories of assumptions about the world would be answered or, or boxes would be filled, and that will give you a picture of the person's worldview. So um, bear with me, there's going to be some slightly technical terminology here. Probably most of it you've heard, but it's not, they're not always everyday words, but we can deal with it. It's okay. Um, so I would say the first, and then there are different ways to do this. This is my own kind of framing of it. Um, I think these categories cover a large part and the most important parts of a person's worldview. We can certainly add others to them, but the most basic kind of question or, or the most general or universal question we can ask or questions we can ask are questions of ontology. Ontology basically means the study of what is, what exists and what doesn't exist. What kind of entities exist? Does the tree outside my window exist? Do I exist? D does my mind exist? Do I have a soul? Uh, does God exist, right? I mean, God, it would be an existent, a kain, um, uh, something mawjud, uh, if, if, if God exists. So in a worldview, uh, so ontology is what exists, okay? Is there an unseen realm? Are there angels? Or is it just what I can empirically verify that exists, right? Th th these are all questions of ontology. And the way a worldview answers this is quite uh, impactful, has quite an impact on the way a person sees the world, um, as I think should be obvious, and we'll get into it uh, in, in some more detail. Among the things that may or may not exist, I mean, just hypothetically speaking, um, is, is God, right? does God exist? If the answer to, to that question in a particular worldview is yes, then you will have a theology, right, in addition to an ontology. And then I put theology higher because if God does exist, then God is the primary existent and therefore the most foundational existent. And so theology then becomes sort of the highest category of, uh, of reflection and of knowledge and of understanding because it pertains to the highest being and to the most foundational uh, aspect of all existence, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Um, so who or what is God if God exists, right? So you would have a theology. So theology sort of branches out of ontology, but again, just if you're thinking about it through, through it logically, uh, you don't get to a theology until you answer the ontological question of, is there a God, right? Uh, and, and if there is, well, then God comes first, okay? The next uh, set of questions, also very fundamental that we can ask, are questions of epistemology. Probably most people are familiar with this term, epistemology. What is knowledge and how do we acquire it? What does it mean to know? And more particularly, more importantly for us, what are the sources of our knowledge? When I say, I know that, or we know that, as opposed to I think that, or I conjecture that, or I merely believe that, okay? Uh, X is the case. What does it mean to know and what are the sources of knowledge, right? 
then anthropology, and I don't mean by anthropology sort of the modern university discipline, but I mean in the sense of who or what is man. Anthropos is al insan. So this is alim and insan. They actually translate anthropology as alim and insan. But I mean the more fundamental philosophical question, right? Anthropology is, a, is an empirical science uh, in, the, in the modern university. But I mean as a philosophical question, who or what is man? Okay. And we'll see the debates about human origins, evolution, and so on and so forth. Many people just dive into this uh, as if it were a purely scientific question, uh, which is to concede so much ground to the materialistic view of the world, as we will come to see, uh, that people don't understand that this is first and foremost a philosophical question. And the place of science in answering this question is going to depend on your philosophical answer to the question first and foremost, before getting out like DNA evidence and going through the fossil evidence and all of that. So anyway, anthropology. Then we have the question of teleology. So is there a purpose? Telos means purpose, raya, they would say in Arabic. Is there a purpose of the universe of man? I brought these questions up before, or is there no purpose? Is there, is there no teleology? Okay. Then we have question of morality and ethics. As we said before, what am I to do? How ought I to behave? What, I, what ought I to do or not to do? Question of morality and ethics. And how do we know? How do I know what's right and wrong? How do I know what I am to do or not to do? So what is right and wrong? Then after this, question of law and politics. And these are kind of in descending order of gen generality to specificity, also abstraction to concreteness, You know, however you want to look at it. It's not really too important right now. But then morality and ethics is also applied you know, uh, um, based on your moral and ethical assumptions. You have questions of law and politics. What is valid law? Where does, where does law come from? What is a good law that should be obeyed by, you know, citizenry is kind of a modern term, but by the people living in a particular place, right? What laws are valid? Um, and how do we know that? And then what kind of political system is sort of roughly ideal, uh, knowing that we live in an imperfect world? What is sort of the, the, the best kind of, you know, political arrangements we should come up with? And many people don't realize, right, that uh, questions, especially many of the burning questions today, and that pro, pro, uh, sort of um, caused the most problems for Muslims, both in our interactions with others and in terms of our own sort of, again, fighting within ourselves, are really questions mostly of morality and ethics and also of law and politics. And people don't realize that how we approach questions of morality and of law and politics is dependent on an underlying conception of morality and ethics, which itself is dependent on an underlying knowledge, you know, um, underlying assumption of what kind of creature the human being is and what the human being's needs and interests are, which all is therefore a, dependent on a particular epistemology and an ontology. So all of these are interconnected. And it's a mistake. And I think it's a very grave mistake that many Muslims today are making when they start to deal with a particularly these lower order questions. I mean, no, lower order, not in the sense that they're less important, but in the sense, in the sense that they are derivative from higher order assumptions about the world, right? Many people dive into morality, moral and ethical questions and legal and political questions and just argue about them on the surface without understanding that, again, the difference between one person's view and another really does go back to much more fundamental uh, assumptions about, again, on these higher levels, ontology, either higher or like deeper lying, however, you know, you want to uh, look at the metaphor. Uh, ontology, epistemology, anthropology, and so on. Um, and, and you'll see why, hopefully, as we uh, go on. And then there's a question, I, I put the last one, the question of aesthetics, which might be kind of uh, unexpected here in otherwise, what is otherwise a very kind of philosophical and dry terminology so far, uh, the question of what is beauty and what is beautiful. And I always say that you can actually tell a lot about a culture and about the worldview of a people or of a civilization by looking at what it regards as beautiful and therefore what it produces as art, right? And uh, you know, you can, especially in the case of like Western history, which has changed a lot over the last thousand years, if you just take a, you know, a, an overview of Western art from the Middle Ages through the Renaissance, through the early modern period into the 19th century, 20th century, so forth, you can really tell a lot about what is going on in the culture what kind of values are being held, what's important, what are priorities, what are some of the basic assumptions about the world, just by looking at the art that this civilization kind of produces. And it's as true about Islam as it is about Western civilization or any other. 
if you look at our art, whether it's architecture or calligraphy or whatever, you know, uh, that's a very particular worldview which, which is capable, which produced that. And it is therefore redolent of a very particular way of looking at the world and expressive of it. So aesthetics is actually also, I think, uh, important. Also, the aesthetic aspect of life is, is, is a fundamental one, which is downplayed, particularly as of the mid 20th century, um, which is why anything built in the 1950s and after is usually very ugly. Um, anyway, at least for a couple of decades, you get very ugly uh, architecture.